uh, thank you for the opportunity of sharing uh, some of these studies on Revelation with you. Uh, so we're into our last two sessions uh, this evening. Um, number five, about the blowing of the trumpets. And number six, a little bit later on pouring of the bowls. Now, uh, as you will probably appreciate, the further we get into the book of Revelation, the more uh, complex and involved some of the symbols become. And for that reason, uh, we have a little bit of a challenge uh, for this evening's two studies. And that's because when we looked at the first study and the second study, uh, questions, themes and patterns and the beast of revelation, we didn't have so much subject matter to cover. Uh, but when we come now to dealing with all of the trumpets in one session and all of the bowls in one session, we're covering a lot of scripture. And normally uh, you would want to do the trumpets in six or seven sessions to do it in detail. So what we're doing tonight is really just a bit of a summary and a big picture overview. Now, for that reason, I've got a little bit of a difficulty, and that is that I'm not able to stop and explain my reasoning in detail uh, for every point that I make. And especially with some of the historical connections, you might be left saying, mm, that sounds interesting, but I, you haven't given any evidence. You haven't given me any proof. I can't be confident that what you're saying is right. And I want to say that that's fair enough and you are quite uh, welcome to withhold your judgment in relation to some of the things that we look at. In fact, I, I prefer that if people do that and, and not just assume that what I'm saying and what I'm presenting is correct. I, I believe it is. And in um, an opportunity where we had more sessions, I believe we'd be able to tease out the detail and provide more evidence. Uh, but just please understand that with this kind of a study, we're sort of locked into a big picture and an overview. And for that reason, um, you might require more evidence uh, down the track uh, in relation to some of the things that I say tonight. Okay, I hope that makes sense. All right, so let's launch into the trumpets. We find the trumpets in three of the uh, chapters of Revelation. And that's one of the challenges we've got with this, this uh, particular subject, is it spans three chapters. We have what is called the four wind trumpets in chapter eight. Okay, they're called the winds in chapter seven, verse one, but they're blown finally in chapter eight, the one, two, three, and four. And then there is an announcement at the end of chapter eight saying that there are three more trumpets to come and they are woe trumpets. And the word woe just means doom. These are terrible things that are coming. These judgments are on the earth. And then in chapter nine, we have the beginning of the woe trumpets. And they are the last three of the seven trumpets. So the fifth trumpet is the first woe trumpet. And that's from verses one to 12 of chapter nine. The second woe is the sixth trumpet. And this is interesting because that covers or that is covered in chapter 9 verse 13 to 20 and it focuses on events in the eastern part of the roman empire and then still part of the sixth trumpet we have chapter 11 verses 1 to 14 and that is events which happen in the western part of the empire 
Now you might be asking, well, what about chapter 10? Well, chapter 10 is an interesting little chapter and it's kind of separate and, and on its own to the general flow of the narrative. So we're not going to look at chapter 10 uh, tonight. And then finally, the seventh trumpet is from chapter 11, verses 15 to 19. And then if you remember the structure and the flow of Revelation, it also includes the whole of chapter 16 and the vials or the bowls. Because remember that the vial, bowls or the vials are included really in the seventh trumpet. Okay, so chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 11, and chapter 16 really are all part of the trumpet story. Uh, but we'll look at chapter 16, which is the bowls, uh, in our next session, and we'll try to just briefly uh, touch on the significance of each of the other trumpets in chapter 8 and chapter 9 uh, in this session. Okay. Again, why are these trumpets being blown? Well, we know they are causing damage. We know that they are judgments. We know that they are catastrophes and things on the earth which are causing trouble. What's the reason for them, though? Why is God doing this? Well, remember that in Revelation chapter 9, these trumpets are called plagues and there are people who are watching the effect of these plagues and verse 20 and 21 tells us the kind of effect that these things were intended to have upon them it was intended to make them repent that's the reason for these events and it's really interesting when we sometimes look out on our world, even today, and we can look back on 2020 and say that there was um, COVID-19, uh, the pandemic, uh, which we are still all experiencing in this world. There's all the trouble in America with, uh, with um, the divisions and everything over there. Uh, in, in India, you've had trouble on your borders with China and also um, trouble with Pakistan over Kashmir. Uh, there's been events in Europe. All of these things can sometimes overwhelm us and we think, what is the reason why all these things are being allowed to happen upon the earth? Well, it doesn't need to be any more complex than really this point here. All these things can be the means by which God gives people a wake-up call. He gives them cause to consider their life. He gives them cause to stop and think and to repent. And there are obviously some people who are oblivious to the significance of the events and they don't look internally and they don't look in the mirror. But as the children of God, when we are disturbed by um, dramatic events in the world, it can be sometimes confusing as to what to do with that information. Well, all we need to do really is go to the mirror, take the opportunity to say, am I ready? Have I repented? Am I on the Lord's side? And if those events cause us to... Uh, do that and have that uh, introspection and that self-examination, then they're really being allowed to have the same effect that the seals, the trumpets and the bowls were to have on the nations uh, all through history. Okay, so we remember that in our last session, the seals finished with the fall of pagan Rome. And that was replaced by Christian Rome. And Christian Rome uh, became more and more powerful as the years went by. And I've got a, 
a little quote here, which, which is useful and it's interesting. It talks about the rise of the Catholic Church, which was, of course, centered in Rome and inherited um, that mantle, really, from the Roman Empire. And it says here, the period after 350 AD saw the slow rise of the Roman community and its bishop to a monarchical position of dominance in the West. So the Roman church had become the most important church. And that was because it was in the capital city of the Roman Empire. And each church had its bishops, the rulers of the church. And the Roman bishop gradually became more and more powerful. And he became known as the Pope. All right. Now, there was still the emperor of the empire, but there was the religious ruler who was becoming just as powerful in many ways. The emperor was now over in the east of the empire, based in Constantinople. But the religious center was now in Rome. The emperor was remote and predominantly involved in the east. He had exempted the Roman clergy from taxes and granted them their own jurisdiction over questions of faith and civil law. So it just shows how powerful the religious ruler in the West, the bishop, the Pope, was becoming. It was the Emperor Theodosius the Great, who was a Spaniard, who at the end of the fourth Christian century decreed a ban on all pagan cults and sacrificial rites and accused those who broke this law of injured majesty, so a crime against the state. That made Christianity now formally a state religion, the state religion. The Catholic Church was now the state church, and heresy, that means having a belief that was different from the Bishop of Rome, heresy was a crime against the state. So this is remarkable. What a revolution. In less than a century, the persecuted church had become a persecuting church. Its enemies, those who selected from the totality of the Catholic faith, were now also the enemies of the empire and were punished accordingly. For the first time, Christians killed other Christians because, because of differences in their views of faith. And, uh, and that sets the tone for the centuries that are now going to unroll upon the Christian world. The Pope is going to become the one who tells you what is right and what is wrong. The Pope is going to explain what the Bible means. The Pope is going to claim to be Jesus Christ on the earth. And the Pope is going to be a power just like all the other nations with an army, with a navy, with, with soldiers and guns and weapons. Okay. We sometimes in our day and age don't realize just how powerful the Catholic church was during this period. And he had all the support and backing of the emperor. And uh, I won't read all of this slide here, but Emperor Theodosius, he basically says here that anyone who doesn't believe in the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, we have the uh, permission from Almighty God and the responsibility uh, to put them to death. Okay, Christians persecuting Christians. So you can say that there's almost, um, it's almost clear that there's a, there's a false Christianity now um, that's ruling in the world. 
Okay. Now, coming on to the trumpets in Revelation chapter 8, I'm going to give you the key to what's really going on right at the very beginning. And the key is this slide here. The first four trumpets are really all about the fall of Rome in the western part of the empire. And it's all about the barbarian invasions, the carving up and the dividing of what was once a strong and united, powerful Roman Empire. And all of these nations, all these barbarian tribes and hordes, poured over the River Danube from the north and pillaged and plundered and took their own territory uh, through this whole area, gradually over a period of about 400 years. And the big picture, remember, is Daniel chapter 2. And this is the process by which the clay mixes among the iron. So this is the end of the legs of iron and the beginning of this uh, mixture of barbarians and Romans. So what was the first trumpet all about? It says the third part of the trees were burnt up. And again, in that detail the time, the first trumpet really uh, demonstrated to be speaking about Alaric the Goth. The Visigoths came from right up here in this region and they poured over the rivers in the north here and invaded the Roman Empire. And Alaric came all the way into the heartland of the empire. And he even finally came in 410 to the gates of Rome. And this was a huge shock because up until this point, there had been trouble with barbarians on the borders and there had been um, skirmishes and problems but never before had the Roman Empire been successfully invaded like this. And Alaric came to Rome in 410 and he sacked the city of Rome. And this is the first trumpet. And it's interesting what the historians say about this sacking of Rome. The first inkling that the sleeping Romans received, that the barbarians were among them, came when they were woken by the harsh bray of Visigoth trumpets. Mm -hmm. So the, the Visigoths entered the city, woke everybody up with their trumpets, and Rome was pillaged. This was a completely shocking thing um, for the empire to experience. After that, um, the, the uh, leader, Alaric, died and was buried in Italy. And the Visigoths continued on up through Gaul and then down into Spain, which is where they settled. And so all of a sudden, the Roman Empire was not as big as it was and the Visigoths were um, content they had their own homeland now. Part of the Roman Empire was now Goth territory. That's a huge event. Now, the second trumpet is described as a great mountain burning with fire. And it has huge effect on the sea. And this relates to the Vandals. Um, Genseric was the Vandal leader and he came all the way down through Gaul from the north again through Spain and then across the top of North Africa and made a base in Carthage 
And from Carthage, he became a pirate. He made many, many ships and he would sail across the Mediterranean Sea and pillage the different ports and cities all around the Mediterranean basin. And he had no um, real um, plan or strategy. He just said, leave the determination to the winds. They will transport us to the guilty coast whose inhabitants have provoked divine justice. So their uh, idea was just to cause havoc, uh, to cause vandalism, really. That's where the word comes from, the vandals. And uh, on, on one occasion, they even went north across, um, across the sea from Carthage. They sailed up the river Tiber. And again, Rome was sacked. Rome was plundered. And a little interesting footnote, it's believed that when Jerusalem fell to the Romans about 400 years before this time, the lampstand from the temple had been kept in Rome for all that time. And it is believed that the vandals uh, stole the lampstand from the temple uh, but on the way back, their ship was caught in a storm. One of the ships was caught in a storm, and it was the ship that was carrying the lampstand of the temple, and it sunk in the sea. And so it is, it is believed, it is rumoured that perhaps the lampstand from Herod's temple uh, ended up somewhere in this region at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. It's quite an interesting fact or an interesting um, idea. Now, eventually, the Roman emperor got together a flotilla of ships and sailed and met uh, the, um, the huge fleet of pirate ships that the Vandals had centered at Carthage. And there was a massive battle on the water and the sea became blood as it were. Now, the third trumpet is called, uh, fell a, a great star from heaven. It's, it's a meteorite. It's something that was um, brilliant, lit up the sky, um, was, 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 was powerful, and then suddenly was gone. And, and it's a wonderful uh, symbol for the next major power that brought trouble to the Western Roman Empire. Uh, that the world and contributed rapid down empire. The trumpet effects is said to be the rivers and the fountains. Now, Attila came down from this region and really devastated the middle part of the Roman Empire here. And it had a, had a devastating effect. In fact, um, this quote here from the um, Gibbon is, is interesting. It says the Huns so devastated the place when, that when the Roman ambassadors passed through to meet with Attila several years later, they had to camp outside the city on the river. The riverbanks were covered with human bones and the stench of death was so great that no one could enter the city. And a very interesting um, fact about this trumpet is that this here is the region of ancient Thrace. Uh, this is Thrace here. And you can see that it's just north of where 
or, or just near the city of Constantinople. So it's a very, very um, significant part of the Eastern Empire that the emperor is supposed to have control over. And what's interesting about this map, I'll show you here, uh, speaking about the third trumpet, it says the name of the star was Wormwood, which is the Greek word of synthos. A third of the waters became Wormwood and many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. And there is a region in Thrace, which was devastated by Attila the Hun, and it's called Absinthia. And the particular river in that air region, Absinthos, the same word uh, for wormwood. This was the region devastated uh, by Attila the Hun. Well, he went on from um, the northern uh, part of the, or the eastern part of the empire, back north to his capital, launched further campaigns along the rivers and into the region of Gaul. And then finally, his most devastating campaign in 452, down through the top area of Italy, which is known to be a place of rivers and fountains. And he was about to destroy Rome, sack Rome, when the Pope, Pope Leo, uh, came out to meet him and convinced him to withdraw. But he had already done enough damage to the Western part of the empire. And uh, it's very, very soon after this, in fact, only a matter of months later, when Attila uh, on his wedding night uh, developed, it seems, a nosebleed and uh, because he'd been partying too hard and, and he died very suddenly. So he's like that star that was for 12 years ablaze across the Roman Empire, causing all this destruction and attention and then boom, out and it's over. And uh, there is some historical um, uh, scholars who believe that the rumors that his wife actually murdered him that night. Um, but obviously that has not been able to be uh, substantiated. And Attila the Hun was buried by his men. Uh, a, the river was a river somewhere in that region was diverted and it's believed he was um, buried underneath a river. Um, and to this day, they have not been able to find the tomb of Attila the Hun. Well, you can imagine with all these barbarian hordes causing havoc throughout the empire, one after another, Rome in the West is now weak. It's ready to fall. And the fourth trumpet describes an eclipse and we won't uh, go into much of the detail here but another goth Odoacer with the Ostrogoths in 476 came into the Rome and take took Rome and the Roman Empire now transferred into the hands of the goths So all the barriers plays now. What is the beginning of the Pope is still there and he is going to gradually develop his power again, but he's going to have to try to make new alliances with the barbarians because the emperor in the East is not able to protect him anymore. And so this is the beginning of the period which 
develops into the Holy Roman Empire. The Holy Roman Empire is still hundreds of years away. It's going to develop and become something of significance in around about AD 800. So about 300 years still. But what the Pope is going to do is he's going to wield all of these nations into an alliance of sorts, still individual powers, and he is going to rule among those nations. And he's going to become very close to, for example, the king of the French, Charlemagne. He's going to be very powerful and influential in Spain. All these regions are going to become Catholic Europe. But the Eastern Roman Empire is going to continue for a bit. And this is what the trumpets now do. Whereas the eighth chapter of Revelation focuses on the events in the West, now chapter nine turns attention to the Eastern part of the empire and tells us the things which finally contributed to the downfall of this city here, Constantinople, New Rome. And that's where we get the fifth trumpet in Revelation chapter nine. And it's very interesting actually, because the symbols now become a little bit more complex. We have uh, a locust, which is similar to that of a horse, but it has a tail like a scorpion and crowns of gold and faces of men and teeth of lion and breastplates of iron. And, and it's very interesting to try to imagine what it is that John is seeing and what future power is being anticipated in language that John can see and understand and write about. Now, we know from uh, the Old Testament that locusts are a symbol for vast armies, armies of men at times. And the tail like a scorpion is, is, is interesting because it's thought that that could refer to some technology which these armies have access to, which was new to John and unable um, for him to be able to put any more words to it than the ones that he did. Uh, and, and that proves to be the case. Basically, the fifth trumpet is about the rise and the spread of Islam. Uh, it was in about um, uh, five, the late 500s that uh, Muhammad was born and remember his revolution really started uh, between Mecca and Medina in this region. And the spread of Islam was incredible. Spread of Islam created within a century in under 100 years, a unified cultural and economic zone from India, here's the Indus River here, which you're all familiar with, to the Atlantic Ocean within and and the eastern roman empire was never the eastern empire across the africa after the same and if it wasn't for charles martin uh, it's quite possible that the Muslims would have taken the whole of the pressure and Constantinople did not fall in the fifth Trump party empire. Much of it was lost and much of it was weakened. And of course, as you all well know, um, the spread of Islam uh, has not really stopped 
uh, it certainly has um, achieved its purpose as far as the sixth, um, the fifth trumpet is concerned. But but even today, um, you will be familiar with that picture. I'm sure that is the the uh, uh, the holy place of Islam in in Mecca. Okay, you just quickly check the time here. All right, so we're just going to quickly go through uh, the sixth trumpet. And this is also focusing on events in the East. And uh, that there is a, an artist's depiction of what is described in verse 17. Amazing. You know, you've got a, got a, got a horse with a lion's head. And uh, uh, those on the horses are wearing breastplates, the color of fire, uh, and, and uh, yeah, a very, very um, vivid imagery. But the, the sixth trumpet is about the release of the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So remember that in the west, the river Danube was holding back all the barbarian hordes. But eventually they came over the river and they carved up the Western Roman line. Well, a similar thing is going to happen in the East. Here's the, um, the capital, Constantinople. The Eastern Roman Empire was all this region. Much of this is now in the hands of the Muslims as well. But battles continue between the Rome and the Muslims. But the river Euphrates comes from here all the way down to here. And there are four powers that over the next few centuries gradually infiltrate and take over large parts of this region. The Seljuks, the Mongols, the Tamerlanes and the Ottoman Turks. And I think Brother Thomas uh, yesterday asked a question about Genghis Khan, uh, the Mongols. Well, this is where the um, Mongols and Genghis Khan uh, have a place in Bible prophecy. But the last of those powers, the most powerful one, was the Ottoman Turks. And the Ottoman Turks... Uh, by the 1400s are now overtaking and totally overrunning the Eastern Roman Empire. But the last big city that they had to take was, of course, Constantinople. And it was one of the most incredibly uh, fortified cities of its time. The walls were incredible. Uh, and the big question had always been, how on earth can you get through the walls of Constantinople? And it was Sultan Mehmet II who found the way. Uh, and he brought all the way to the walls of Constantinople, new technology, huge cannons, and it's believed that this is the technology which is symbolized uh, by the, the, the fire and the sulfur and, uh, and the, the imagery of the sixth trumpet in Revelation chapter nine. And uh, they had cannons which were just enormous. And the, it is believed that every time one of these cannons was fired, it would necessitate the death of, of its operator. Constantinople fell in 14, and that was the Roman. Empire in the East. But while the East 
uh, you have the um, the papacy amongst at, at some of its most powerful power, powerful years, some of its most powerful years. And so we come to Revelation chapter eleven, where the focus turns back on the West, and what Revelation chapter eleven uh, kind of does in the first fifteen verses is it catches us up on some of the significant history uh, and the important information uh, that's been happening in the West. And in fact, chapter 12 and chapter 13 is part of that story because it's about the development of that fourth beast. And of course, the earth beast in Revelation chapter 13 is the Holy Roman Empire which by this time is now um, been in power for a number of centuries and uh, has been holding its own successfully against Islam. But sadly, as we well know, this period of history was some of the darkest for the Christians who were not accepted as being true Christians by the Catholic Church. And we have during that period, uh, the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, we have um, many uh, believers who are put to death and persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church. Revelation chapter 11 tells us, though, that that period comes to an end. And the great event which destroyed the Holy Roman Empire was the French Revolution in 1789 to 1809. The French Revolution and its aftermath broke the hold that Catholic uh, Church and the Catholic power had over the whole of Europe. And there was the Reformation, which had happened prior, which was already starting to have a big effect. So Protestantism uh, started to become um, a force to be reckoned with, with the Catholic Church. And gradually, everybody started to come out from underneath the Catholic Church's control and wanted to explore the Bible for themselves, wanted to be able to read, think, create, uh, grow, without being under the iron foot of Rome. And in fact, it's no uh, surprise that the Christadelphians, which is what we are, developed and grew in the 1800s. If you have a look at any other major um, Protestant religion or um, even, even the not so prominent ones like um, the Seventh-day Adventists, for example, or, or you could say the Jehovah's Witnesses or, or the Baptists, all right, or the Church of Christ, all of these uh, religious Christian bodies sprung up in the 1800s and the reason they did so is because by that time the french revolution had occurred and the spirit of the french revolution was liberty equality fraternity the idea that church and state should be separate the church has no business having an army to enforce its will. Uh, politics and religion should not be in the same room. That was the uh, outcome of the French Revolution. And we owe it to the forces which were unleashed in the French Revolution. We owe it to that, that we have our freedom today, uh, mostly in the West at least, um, to practice religion ourselves. I know the situation in India 
is a little bit different. And in some ways, uh, you can possibly understand what it was like prior to the French Revolution when you had a government which was telling its people what they had to believe. Uh, we haven't had that in the West uh, since the French Revolution. Okay, so uh, that's time on that session. And like I said at the very beginning, I appreciate that that's very, very uh, hop, skip and a jump. <laughs> uh, it's a very brief overview of those chapters and the significant events which they speak of. Um, but uh, but that's, that's uh, all we can really achieve in this kind of a session. But hopefully um, that's been useful. Okay, I'm gonna pause there and I'm gonna give a couple of minutes, uh, Jimmy, if that's okay, um, available for some questions. Sure. Uh, and, then, it does. and then we'll have five minutes break five, 10 minutes break before we go on with the next session, I think. Sure, yeah, I don't see any questions in the chat. Uh...